Good morning. Welcome to this webinar on chemistry and food, safety, authenticity, and other challenges. My name is Ayana Lynch, and I'm a research assistant with the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The Roundtable provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to chemical sciences and engineering and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This is the second webinar of 2023 and a series of webinars on emerging topics. We launched our series of webinars in early 2020 and all of the recordings are available on the CSR website. Today we'll examine the current landscape of synthetic food and cellular agriculture and explore how the chemical sciences can provide insights into the modern food industry. The format will consist of three presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations conclude. Dr. Carlos Gonzalez and Dr. Nicola Pohl will be our moderators for this webinar. In addition to being members of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable, Dr. Gonzalez is the Chief of the Chemical Sciences Division of the National Institute of Sciences of Standards and Technology. And Dr. Pohl is a Professor of Chemistry, the Joan and Marvin Carmack Chair in Bioorganic Chemistry, and the Associate Dean of Natural and Mathematical Sciences and Research for the College of Arts and Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. They'll be asking the questions on behalf of the audience during the discussion time. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom located in the bottom control panel. Note that the chat feature has been disabled on Zoom for audience members. Finally, I would like to invite everyone to our upcoming events, including a webinar workshop series on publications in the future. This workshop will be held both online and in person at the National Academy of Sciences building in Washington, DC. To find out more about our upcoming events or to suggest topics for future events, please see the CSR website. With that, I would like to pass the mic to Dr. Pohl and Dr. Gonzalez for their point-counterpoint discussion. Well, Carlos, I'm so excited about this. I got into chemistry for a love of food, I have to admit. And so the fact that we're coming up with all sorts of new ways of making food is just fantastic. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. This is going to be a very interesting seminar and, uh, you know, uh, webinar. And I think uh, I eat a lot too. So, I mean, everybody eats. So I think this, these issues are important. Uh, so, this, you know, in a, it is true that there are a lot of, uh, con, you know, exciting about this, this new way of uh, making food and so on and so forth. And people are waiting the pros and cons. But there are actually issues that people are really concerned about. Uh, some of those... Uh, uh, are related to, for instance, uh, you know, the the use of genetic uh, engineering and recombinants on some of these foods, and um, people don't seem to understand uh, what's behind uh, what people are actually doing in, when they make these foods and use uh, these kind of technologies. And uh, there is a lot of concern. People that are actually very uh, health aware, and uh, the use of unknown chemicals. You know, one of the issues that uh, some of the, the people actually have is well, you know. Some of these uh, chemicals have been added to these these uh, these uh, uh, new foods, uh, lab-grown food, uh, are not really made available uh, to the public, so they don't have independent way of uh, you know uh, check what uh, what what the the producers actually uh, claim they have there. So there is a lack of transparency. Those are concerns that I that I've heard about uh, lack of comprehensive analysis. You know how do we know that uh, the the nutrition uh, that actually the, the, the producers actually claim these foods have is actually real. So some of these concerns are actually something that I'm hopefully we'll be able to clarify today in this, uh, this uh, round of our webinars. Totally true, Carlos. I mean, there are definitely still technological issues and cultural and ethical issues we need to discuss, all of which are around food. But when you think about it, there's a possibility of, for example, having cheese or ice cream without ever having a cow. Um, since my grandfather was a dairy farmer, that's a bit mind blowing <laughs> that I could perhaps have the proteins and the components produced in a different way, starting with corn or whatever it might be and turning it into something that I can then turn into cultured cheeses so we can maintain all those rich traditions of cheese making that's in my family lineage without actually having some of the environmental consequences of large scale dairy farming, for example. And let alone, you know, I'm vegetarian, but there's meat too, right? That, that has environmental consequences. So there's a lot of promise here, in my opinion, in, in doing, making foods in different ways. 
Absolutely. I think uh, the, the, the fact that uh, you could probably replace, uh, you know, trying to actually minimize the use of uh, carbon and, and fuels, uh, fossil fuels, right, and uh, the emissions and so on and so forth, that uh, seems to be pretty attractive. However, there are, again, there are issues related to the safety and uh, of processed foods, right? Processing food is actually complicated because uh, what do we define by process? Everything is processed. I think what we're talking right. about here is that the way this processing actually happens in these new uh, in new areas, right? In uh, food and new technologies. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there are potential, uh, people actually concerned with potential contamination uh, and need for antibiotics, but now actually you have some of these uh, meats actually coming from cell from animals, right? They might actually have some uh, contamination because that have not been treated by antibiotics. And then if you put those in the, in the reactors, the reactors might be contaminated. So uh, I know that some of the producers, uh, the, the, the people that make these foods uh, claim that they don't, they don't need to actually use and add antibiotics. But there is a group of people that are actually highly concerned with that. And I really appreciate your, issue, your, your uh, uh, point about uh, culture. Culture is one of those that is very important. So as we move forward into this new era, when uh, we have these new kind of foods, uh, what do we do with the people that actually, the farmers, for instance, and people that depend in slaughterhouses and things like that? Right, right, because as Wendell Berry says, agriculture, it's culture. Um, and so as we start culturing cells or culturing biofermentation vats, that's a very different kind of culture than what certainly my grandfather could, could relate to um, hand milking cows every twice a day, right? So there's so many interesting issues that come up with food um, that we, we really, you know, I'm really looking forward to this fantastic group of people we've brought together to help us think about some of these issues and with the group that we've assembled here online to start having real discussions about this. Um, you know, where, where the, what, what technology do we still need to develop? Um, and how do, we, how do we think about these kinds of foods in the, the development of culture? Absolutely. And the other issues that are actually more mundane, but still very relevant, is actually the, the cost, you know, uh, the scalability of the product and the cost, right? So and that's another, at the moment, some of these foods are still pretty expensive and, uh, and people call it boutique kind of food, you know? And uh, so where are we going with that? And hopefully, hopefully the three speakers today will be able to clarify some of these issues that people actually think about it. But I think this is going to be very, very exciting. And, uh, you know, if we can keep talking about this and I, you know, I just forget that we had a webinar to run. Yes. So what we just go back to the <laughs> webinar and, uh, and uh, let's introduce our, our speakers. Uh, so it is a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Nick Halla. Uh, Mr. Halla joined Impossible Foods uh, uh, as his first uh, employee, actually, and helped uh, build the company from the ground up uh, during the last uh, 11 years. Uh, and he's been actually the chief strategy officer and SVP of uh, Retail International. Uh, he also sat on the board of uh, Kite Hill, makes yogurt and cheese for almonds, Mickey. Uh, so, and uh, currently I think Mr. Halle is working on new climate ideas. Uh, he's very passionate about climate issues uh, with the mission of rapidly decrease atmospheric concentrations of methane, which is actually highly relevant to what we're talking about today. And also of course, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, so essentially to change the trajectory of our climate change, which is highly needed uh, in our days. Uh, in addition, I think he's an independent board director at Inner Plant, uh, where they are actually transforming farming by enabling, enabling crops to communicate with growers. This is actually very fascinating. Uh, one of my kids is actually a molecular engineer, and I was actually telling him about this conversation that we had with Nick about it, that he was very, very excited because he thinks this is a way for the future. This is actually very cool. Uh, so Mr. Halle has, a, uh, he holds a BS in chemical engineering from uh, University of Minnesota, uh, an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and also an MS in environmental resources from the Stanford School of Earth Sciences. With a further ado, I'll, I'll just pass it over to Nick. Thank you, I appreciate that. And Nicola, I'm wearing uh, this for you for uh, Kite Hill for cultured, Cultured cheese, where we use natural cultures to take uh, nuts and make them taste like delicious cheese. So lots of fun stuff going on in that, uh, that area of the world. So let me do this. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so give me one second and put in presentation. All right. Are we good to everyone see this? Yes. Perfect. All right. 
So thank you for the overview and uh, introducing me. You know, I've spent my career in food and ag. So I grew up on the, a dairy farm, so that wasn't kind of part of the intro. So I've been doing uh, food production most of my life. I'm a chemical engineer, worked at General Mills. And then the last uh, 15 years, uh, moving out to California, I've been working on kind of starting new businesses and trying to revolutionize categories to make a much more sustainable world, whether that be solar energy, food production, agricultural production. And so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give everyone a bit of an overview of you know, where we are in climate. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest challenges or in my opinion, the biggest challenge we have right now. Um, and then you know, link that to the food system, the challenges we have there, and then look at opportunities. And hopefully after this, everyone will get a little bit of inspiration, some ideas you know, what, uh, what we can do. Sorry, let's, let's start jumping into climate data. So climate overview, why, you know, why does this matter? Why are we really, as everyone talking about you know, climate change and the impacts that, that could have? So if we look at the last uh, roughly 2000 years, uh, you can see there's, it was relatively flat and then we had a mini ice age uh, driven by some volcanic activity. And then in the last um, a couple hundred years, you know, queued off by the industrial revolution, we've been adding a lot of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, mostly methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide. Uh, that has you know, really started to spike the global temperatures. And you can see this, and it obviously looks uh, pretty stark. But if we then fast forward some projections of where we're going, um, it gets, looks even more stark. So this is a you know handful of projections on the right side, which I'll blow up um, on you know where we might end up at 2100. And you know the biggest point to take away from here is you know if we hit these temperatures, it's as, it's the highest sustained global temperature on Earth in in three million years, and the impacts of that are massive. And so what I've dedicated my life and my work to is uh, finding ways to mitigate that and pull that back down, which has led me to helping start and build Impossible Foods, which our agriculture and food system is actually one of the biggest challenges and one of the, the biggest opportunities we have for tackling climate change. And I'll show some data on that in a, in a minute. So now if we zoom in on the current area and you look at some of these forecasts, you can see you know, several different forecasts. So the yellow line here with error bars is, you know, if we go more as like, you know, business as usual. So emissions continue to increase globally. Uh, we're on path for four to five degrees Celsius temperature rise uh, by 2100. And then you can start seeing these step down as we hit different, you know, policies and action. So we hit net zero. So you'd have net zero. So carbon going into the atmosphere, methane going in the atmosphere and methane and carbon coming out. Um, ends up being zero by 2100. We're on path for about 2.5 to 3 Celsius. And then if we hit uh, net zero by 2050, which you hear a lot of in the media, we're on path for you know high 1. Point, say 1.7 to 2.2 uh, Celsius. Now here's some you know very high level frames. You know what's it going to take to get there? So where are we in all this? And so if we then look at what the global policies are and where we are right now. Uh, you can see on the left side of this chart is the global greenhouse gas emissions in uh, CO2 equivalents per year. And so the black line here on the left side is a historical, and we're over 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalents, so more than 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalents each year. You can see the dip um, kind of right at the end of the black there from COVID, and it's come back, and it's as high as it's ever been. And then you kind of fast forward forward to 2100. The, the blue bar that's in there is like, that's if we hit the policies and we act on them that exist today. And the challenge is, it, it, the good thing is that we are putting policies in place because if we went back to 2015 before the Paris Accord and looked at global policies, we're on path closer to probably three to four Celsius if we hit the policies that are in place. And so now we actually have policies that are starting to bring that down. The challenge is it takes a lot to hit those. And so far we're not hitting those policies. So that's where the action comes into, or we need to hit the policies in order to hit that. But that's still at 2.6 to 2.9 Celsius rise, where the Paris Accord was to keep us under 1.5 Celsius. And that was largely driven by many countries and you know, even many low-lying islands that you know, if we go above 1.5 for a sustained amount of time, a lot of shoreline and a lot of islands are going to be gone as oceans rise, as you know, one of the big drivers of climate, one of the big effects of climate change. So then you kind of look at some of these other things and then and if you look at we hit the pledges and, and targets in place on top of that we can hit about two celsius and then if you look at these orange bars on the graph and uh, that's like looking as like what would it take to get to 1.5 celsius and that's the gap that we have so if we look at 2030 we need to be essentially cutting emissions globally in half and that's in the next six seven years and so far every year we're go still going up and so it's a big challenge of how we're going to get there and we need to be looking at everything 
across the system and I'll start linking this in, to food and app. And so the main drivers here, so you can see that this is another way to look at the data. Uh, the green is the uh, is from carbon dioxide, red is from our dark orange is methane, yellow is from nitrous oxide, and those are the three big drivers. And you can just see all of them are continuing to increase and have increased uh, substantially since past that since 2015. And you look at this globally, and uh, Deloitte did a study and said if we do hit these uh, commitments and policies in place, we're on path for about almost $180 trillion of global economic loss uh, by 2070. And to put that in uh, perspective, we have about $100 trillion of global economy each year. Um, and this is just the, so the, the economic side. The social impacts of this, I think, are much, much, much bigger You know, if we continue to go down this path. So that's the frame of where we are in climate. So now let's look into the food system. And what does the food system have to do with this? And I grew up in beef and dairy farming growing up. I worked in food production. And until I met Pat Brown, the founder for Impossible Food, I had no idea the link between the food system and climate change and the opportunity um, until we started looking at a lot of this data. And I had been like, I came out to California to work in uh, renewable energy. So everything I was doing was solar and biofuels and things like this. But I quickly realized that the food system is by far the biggest opportunity that we have. So if we look at the starting point, so what is the food system's impact today? Uh, more than 45% of the world's land surface is dedicated to it. More than 25% of all the fresh water used uh, is used in agriculture, which is by far the biggest use of fresh water. And in the Western states of the US, um, a lot of that is you know, more than 70, 80% of the water use in a lot of states are from fresh water. Um, which then you know, we hear about the droughts out here and the challenges with that that continue to get challenging. Luckily in California, we had a, a large snowfall last year, which that'll you know help for this year and maybe next year. But the, the water patterns seem to continue to change with climate change, which is going to put more pressure on the land and the water use. Greenhouse gas emissions, so directly for greenhouse gas emissions and warming the earth. Um, you know, agriculture is more than the entire transportation industry. And this is planes, trains, automobiles. Um, and we really talk about transportation, decarbonizing, electrifying all the time. You hear much, much less about food and agriculture. But food and agriculture for greenhouse gas emissions is much bigger. Uh, or, you know, not much bigger, but is bigger. And the other part of this is nitrous oxide and CO2 are much more potent. And then uh, nitrous oxide and methane are much more potent than CO2. So that also links to the opportunity we have to curb that. And then the last one, which is you know very hard to reverse, is you know we've taken out almost it's almost now two thirds of all species um, in the last fifty years have uh, gone away um, from the population, and that's uh, driven a lot by our use of the land. As we continue to push land use out for our use for agriculture, we push a lot of these wild populations out, and as we overfish the oceans and a lot of these freshwater reserves, you know we're taking down those populations. And so we are mining the earth a lot the way we do agriculture now, and we have to change that and make it much more sustainable. Um, so a couple other graphics to kind of highlight this. Um, this one is I always found this fascinating and kind of really stark. So if you take all the land vertebrates left on earth, it's about 90 million tons of weight biomass. Humans are about 420 million tons and cattle is a billion tons, just the cattle on the earth. So that means there's more than 10 times the weight of cattle on earth today than all land vertebrates left. And so essentially we're pushing out all the land like wild vertebrates and other species for our hunger for you know, beef and dairy. And that's what we looked at. And then we looked at this as a resource use perspective and that system produces about 12% of the protein needs for humans. And the challenge is it's a very inefficient system and that's why we need so many. And I'll kind of get into some of those numbers and that links to the opportunity and the you know, chemistry, biochemistry side of how we could really change the system. You look at the land use side, and so if you um, you know back up way back to ten thousand years ago, uh, the land surface was about fifty seven percent forest, forty two percent grasslands, and now you know you, you fast forward, you've taken a lot of those forests, and we went from fifty seven percent to thirty eight percent to add then crops and grazing. You know, same for grasslands, where now we're essentially about a third of the grasslands that we had uh, pre. So we're taking a lot of this land that used to be wild, and you know, converting them into human use and the vast majority of that land is going directly to animal agriculture. And this is also a big part of the opportunity as we'll get to. So, all right, so let's get to the opportunities. Now, how do we think, how do we use the food and agriculture system to change this? And how do we use biotechnology and chemistry to reach the goals? Well, um, you start with the overall framing. So I was in, when I came out to California, I was in solar energy 
And we were looking at this and, you know, and you look at a solar panel back in right 2009, 2010, and like a you know, 10, 15% efficient solar panel was a pretty good solar panel. Um, but I was like, wow, only 10 to 15% efficient. What industries would we ever be happy with a 10 to 15% efficient technology? Like almost none. And then we got to food and it was like a beef cow is a 3% efficient system converting plants and protein and calories over to meat. 3% efficient. So every, for every 33 grams of protein a cow eats and every 33 calories a cow eats, we consume one out as beef. And like, whoa, that's stark. Um, that also links to the opportunity. So now if we instead of build the food system to be a food system that grows plants, feeds to animals, and then we consume the animals, we grow plants and we convert those directly to food, we could have a much, much more efficient food system and use a lot less resources. Now, as you look at the other categories on here, pork is about 9%, chickens, you know, uh, 13 to 21% for calories and protein, and milk is right in between uh, 14 to 17% efficient. But even at, the, even at the peak here, it's like a 20% efficient conversion technology of taking the plants over to human nutrition. We can do much, much better than that. I think that's the opportunity that we have as a group of how to use biotechnology and chemistry to convert the plants into products that people like and actually prefer over these products. And then we can you know, use a tiny fraction of the land surface that we have for agriculture. But do we have, can we do that? It's like, okay, so let's even look at today. So right now, if you take the four main food crops, soy, corn, wheat, and rice, and you look at calories, protein, essential amino acids, just those crops, which are not crops that are dedicated to human nutrition or real necessarily even the right crops for human nutrition. But you take those and you look at the human nutrition qualities of them, like just those four crops have all the essential amino acids, all the calories, all the protein that we would need today. Um, now they're not in forms that people enjoy and like, they're not in the calorically dense, nutritious, like delicious, like form as uh, meat. And so that's what we set out for impossible is like, okay, all the nutrients are already there. Um, and you know, the, we believe essentially that we can take these nutrients and find ways that we can outcompete the animal and create a better product. And by doing that, and this links back to the greenhouse gas and climate side. And so for Impossible Foods, we're always a climate first company. That's why we exist, as we want to produce delicious food for people affordably. And at the end of the day, we want to essentially reverse climate change by transforming the agricultural system to a much more sustainable system. And so this chart shows, and the premise is, if you take the food system, and now in the next 15 years, you go from the really meat heavy system and dairy heavy system we have today, where globally we consume about 750 billion pounds of meat um, yearly. Now we take that and we convert that all to a plant-based ecosystem. Um, you have you know, two main effects. One is you drastically reduce the impact of the agriculture and the food system directly. And so this is mostly pulling out um, methane and, and nitrous oxide emissions. And so that's the purple and the orange bar here. And then two is you take that land now that we now don't, just don't need as much land for agriculture and we use that for biomass recovery. And this would be a chart showing that if you just let biomass grow back up versus also we could go you know, further and do um, you know, planting and management essentially to increase biomass recovery in these places. But just go with the premise that you let biomass recover in these places. Um, you take that line and that black line, which is a business as usual, radiative forcing, which is a, another climate term, and now you flatline it. And so you could essentially flatline and get to that net zero uh, for 30 years, for the next 30 years, starting essentially today, um, as you um, start pulling this, uh, pulling the consumption down and freeing up the land and really buying ourselves 30 years time uh, to solve everything else. That's super powerful. And then really there's no other system that we could do to really help us reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius or less besides this. And so that's really what we've been focusing on. I think that's really the opportunity that we have you know, within this group. But how do you do it? Well, the first part is I think a lot of people realize this, that, you know, meat, fish, dairy foods are absolutely delicious. They have, you know, high nutritional density. Uh, they're very distributed. They're, they're very dynamic. You can cook like a medium burger versus a well-done burger is, you know, a very different application. You can use it in so many different types of food. It's an amazing product and so versatile and it's so dynamic. And so what we set out to do was create products that can outcompete that first on a flavor performance uh, basis. And then you get to nutrition, health, uh, uh, cost, sustainability, and really create a product that has more utility to the consumer globally. And at the end of the day, you know, make it more aspirational. And so we looked at this and said, all right, so what we need to do is like look in the plant-based world, find the ingredients in the plant-based world that are needed to create the most delicious meat, fish, and dairy foods, and then find ways to do this. 
And that led to you know many different innovations. And the first product that we launched here was the Impossible Burger. So meat made from plants, um, really to compete head and head with you know, meat from an animal. And so the product here, this is the raw form. You can see it on the top right picture. Um, you can really cook it in anything from burgers to meatballs, to kebabs, mapo tofu. Um, you know, for a while I ran all the international businesses, which was extremely fun with a product this dynamic. Because in the U.S., like ground beef as a category is very burger heavy. Internationally, it's using everything. Um, so it's kind of fun to see what chefs would create because it is a, a new tool, just like ground beef is a tool essentially for chefs and consumers to make a lot of just del delicious food. And then we make food that has no cholesterol, no hormones, no antibiotics. Uh, we can you know, build it so it has just as much protein, just as much um, balance of essential amino acids. Uh, the iron source is heme, which is very bioavailable in the body. And heme has been a, a protein that's consumed in really a human diet forever between animals, which are very rich in heme to plants, which also has heme proteins and where that heme is the same. So heme has been ubiquitous everywhere. And we, what we learned is that it drives the flavor chemistry of meat as you cook. And then we created all kinds of different products. So burgers, sausage, pork, chicken, meatballs, and many of these products in blind taste tests now versus the animal counterpart are preferred. And so we passed in the sensory perspective and now getting the rest of the utility to the point and the distribution, everything to consumers is, uh, is the path. So, all right, so I'll wrap up with uh, kind of looking at, so how do we make food and some comparison between the systems? So the first one is animals. You know, animals are scaled. We produce 750 billion pounds of meat every year. The challenge of that is the environmental impact. Um, there's, of course, other challenges that we have on this too. Uh, we've scaled it past really the limits, I think, where the system can go to feed the human population. We need to find better systems. So you look there and say like what Impossible is really focused on in Kite Hill as plants. Like, oh, let's use plants, most scalable. And we have all the nutrients we already need, but can we convert them into products that people love and they desire and they crave? Um, you know, with the simple, simple solutions, simple processes that are explainable um, and create products that can outcompete the animal and 100% uh, uh, possible to do. And, you know, we proved that with Impossible. And I think that industry is just getting started. Look at fermentation. That's another tool. So fermentation using yeast, fungus, bacteria to produce uh, proteins, fats, things like this. I have this industry has uh, been running for, you know, 40, 50 plus years at this point. Um, and it's really starting to be applied in food at a mass scale as a system, as we learn how to scale this and get the cost down to be able to do more than just like really, really fine specialty uh, products. But it is more expensive than using plants and just base agriculture. So it's, it is going to be really mostly useful for specialty ingredient opportunities like Yoheem from Impossible, which we use yeast fermentation. And then I know we're going to hear more about this too on the cellular ag side. It's you know, much newer and using cellular technology to reproduce animals. Our animal meat essentially without the animal, but cost and scalability of that system is tough. It's very similar to fermentation in many ways, um, but you have to get the you know cost even much much lower if you start using it this any sort of scale more than a specialty ingredient. And the third one being like chemical synthesis, and this happens in some of the food and the, the some of the flavor or fragrance type work. Um, but it's like you could do chemical synthesis for proteins and fats and things of that nature. Then there's a the question on consumer adoption and, and where that can go. So let me pause there. That's kind of the wrap. And if there are any questions, if we have time, I can take them. Otherwise, we can hit them later. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I do not see any questions uh, uh, online. And uh, let me remind the online uh, people that they, you can submit your questions to the Q&A, uh, pressing the Q&A button on your Zoom uh, uh, session. And uh, I do have a couple of questions. I'm actually getting hungry just looking at your, <laughs> and I'm looking, really looking forward to see uh, Impossible Fish in the future. Mm. And uh, so thank you so much, Nick, for the very, very enlightening uh, talk. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Nikki, so Nikki can introduce the next speaker. Thank you. I'm also starting to get hungry. It's starting to become lunchtime in some of the East Coast. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next um, speaker, Florian Schatman. Um, and given the time, I think I will just let him um, go ahead with the 
the uh, presentation on the, the next topic, and then we will come together as a panel group at the at the end. So Florian, the floor is yours. Great, terrific. Let me just share my screen. Um, and Nikki, if you could, if you don't mind, and let me know if you see that in presentation mode. That looks great. Thank you. Perfect. Let me just uh, get ready here. Okay. Uh, Florian Schattmann, I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Cargo. And, um, and Cargill is an interesting company. It is privately owned, so not a lot of people know a lot about it, but we are actually quite, uh, quite large, uh, 160,000 employees, 158 years old. Um, and we really cover this entire spectrum of, uh, of food. Uh, we're the largest food and ag company on the planet. Um, the discussion that Nikki and Carlos had uh, up front was actually quite interesting because that sounded like an internal discussion, a little bit of count, uh, you know, point counterpoint inside of the world of cargo because we are the, the and, and also what what Nick set the stage for, we're the you know large trader of of, of plant based commodities. We have the ingredient a huge business around ingredients from plants, uh, but at the same time we also have a meat business. So we see both sides, and I think that helps us a little bit to. Uh, to to really weigh what will what might work and what might not work and how it really can play to, play out. So that's um, uh, that's sort of um, the, the the thirty seconds on Cargill. Maybe uh, just a, a thirty seconds on myself. Um, as you can probably hear, I'm originally from Germany. I'm an inorganic chemist by training. I got my PhD at MIT in uh, organometallic chemistry and spent the first twenty years really on the petrochemical side of life. So maybe a little bit like Nick, I just made a switch at some point. Um, and uh, so I worked for Dow, worked for GE and other companies before. And then since almost four years, like almost four years, five years ago, I uh, joined Cargill as the chief technology officer. So now in the food and ag and uh, chemistry is chemistry. A, a, it's actually, uh, actually an advantage to come from the outside and ask questions and, and look around. So... Um, uh, I, I, I would like to highlight a little bit about the, the, the maybe interesting bumpy road of alternative proteins ahead. And when I talk about alternative protein today, I would like to go into a little bit more of the technical challenges and what it takes. Um, and I also would like to really focus on the plant-based, on the cellular-based side. Our dairy is a whole, the dairy without a cow is a whole other area that's really interesting uh, because of lactase. Lactase intolerance and, and, and other uh, in other sort of allergenic reactions. It actually is, is quite ahead in terms of uh, uh, you know acceptance. Um, but today it's all about meat and, and the substitutes for meat here. Um, maybe four or five years ago there was an incredible euphoria around it, and I think we all. And then it got a bump early in in uh, in COVID and. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, and, and we're we're invested of, uh, for the last five years into into uh, into this entire value chain. Um, and the nice thing about Cargill is we play along that entire value chain ingredients as well as the finished product, so we can really see that and how it all fits together. Um, but the wheels have come off a little bit, as as exciting some of the some of the progress the progress has been. Uh, the consumer has kind of. Taking a backseat, um, Europe is still solid, uh, but the the rest of the world, especially North America, and you see some of the the, the big um, the, the big publications and uh, the press has soured a little bit. Um, but that's uh, we we see that um, that's not necessarily terminal. It's just uh, new technologies, new categories take time, and that's kind of the the uh, the area we're we're in right now. Um, and uh, we see actually still a consistent. Um, um, a, you know, growth of the category as we as we as we go forward. Um, so let me level set because not everyone on the phone might or on the on the call might know exactly how the process works. This is a highly oversimplified process, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of what's going on. In the end of the day, uh, to get to plant based meat alternatives, it's somewhat of a material science and formulation problem. Um, you basically put a lot of the ingredients that are necessary, the macronutrients, the micronutrients into a mix. Um, you bring that into sort of, you mix that into a sort of a alternative meat dough, if you want. Um, but then you have to get to this unique structure. There is something about the animal muscle that gives us that unique texture that we 
like Nick said before, that we all love, right? And it's uh, very fibrillous, and and so it's heat, it's pressure, it's uh, it's a, it's a it's a couple of other options, but it's it's trying to get that to get to that uh, texture. And then, of course, uh, how do you formulate that into into a, an end product, right? This is a burger. I think you saw some pictures from the previous uh, presentation um, into chicken nugget and what what have you. And then the downstream distribution is actually pretty much analogous to the meat uh, to the meat business, right? Um, when you look at these alternative protein targets, it's been really a focus on the process portion. So if you look at the one point. Uh, uh, $1.4 trillion meat market, about 400 million. So, you know, are, are around the process. So think burgers, think sausages, pizza toppings, that kind of stuff. That's the easiest to mimic. It's extremely difficult to take a plant-based dough and try to get a, a T-bone steak. Uh, uh, that's, 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 uh, there's no path. There's no technical pathway today to get to that. And so, so that, that process part, which is really only a portion, you know, 400 million out of 1.4 trillion that really is easily accessible there's more of course on the on some of the the, the full muscle chicken and so on but um, that's where the, the, the biggest impact is to be expected um, there are some great products out there um, but there's uh, but the consumer as I said has taken a little bit of a back a step back we all have experienced this and it comes really down to four blocks um, in the end of the day the meat eating experience is still ultimately unparalleled in, in the in the in the big scheme of things and I think uh, better products was was one of the was on the list of plant-based and that's really absolutely true um, in order to get the eating experience very close you have to add a, a, a quite a bit of cost in there so in average it's bouncing around a little bit but there's a 30 to 40 percent cost premium on the plant-based versus the, the meat for a small section of very targeted early adopters, that's not a big deal. For the, to make it beyond boutique, it, it, it is a big deal. You have to get to cost, cost parity. And then there are some nutritional um, uh, you know, uh, concerns or some side effects that have crept in, right? So when you look at the label, all of a sudden, do you really need 25 or 30 or so ingredients and so on? Well, some of them are basically micronutrients that are necessary. There's not a lot of concern and so on, but it is. it looks like a long ingredient deck and, and, and so on. So uh, so there is a lot of work in front of us uh, that has to happen. And I would like to focus a, a little bit on the eating experience and the cost in a, in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. Start with taste and flavor. You are, you're, you're building a formulation. Those, that formulation gets processed sort of into, into a material uh, and that has a certain texture. We'll cover texture, texture in a second. But it also has, of course, has to have superior flavor. These ingredients uh, come with their own flavor profile. So if you think about a pea protein versus a soy protein versus any of them, they, they, they bring their own notes to the table. And some of them are pleasant, some of them are not so pleasant. Sometimes in the formulation, they, uh, they add or, then, or, or they don't add. So, so there's a lot of work still to be done to optimize this, which is great for us uh, scientists in the world, right? There's, there's challenges ahead of us and I, we, we love that in the end of the day. Um, but there may be, there may be some far reaching uh, solutions like breeding new crops. Uh, you know, we, you, we, we have cross breeding technologies. It doesn't have to be GMO, um, but uh, so to get into that area, um, and also do the processing, uh, the, the crop processing a little bit different to make sure that uh, that you can take the, you know, bring the right flavor out of the ingredient. Again, any of those things cannot add a lot of cost. You're already on the dark side there. So, so that's that's one thing. The other, the other part is, of course, uh, when we talk about flavor, we talk, always think intuitively, at least that's what me, happened to me in terms of adding a flavor. Um, but a lot of what flavoring actually is, is about masking and blocking off notes and those kind of things. So, um, so take new technology are needed there and all of this together, um, you know, hopefully will we'll bring more clarity around this. Texture. Texture is going to be important. Meat is very, very unique uh, in texture. I, uh, uh, as, as an in inorganic chemist, I, I didn't know a whole lot about me. I, actually, I didn't even know meat science it kind of existed, but it is a, a true science. Um, and and, 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 the, and the, the meat has this unique fibrillous texture that likes to bind, um, you know, bind the, the, the fats. It, 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 uh, it, 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 
then uh, when you when you eat it, when you cook and then eat it, it releases in your mouth at the right at the right time, um, seeing the salts and so on. So it's just it 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 it, it serves a bunch of purposes in all of this. Um, if on the right side you see um, two different plant-based proteins in a formulation, everything else being uh, held constant, the same extruder, the same the same conditions, the same temperature, everything is the same. And yet you see quite different. Uh, quite different uh, texture building based on the um, you know the amino sequence of the protein that's in there the the, the the secondary tertiary structure all of this kind of stuff so it's a it's really an interesting um, you know science and, and processing challenge to get to 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 make sure that you get to to get to that texture that's so unique uh, really close so um, that not only requires processing techniques although processing is where I personally believe effective, benign, cost-effective processing is where a lot of the unlock will happen. But it also potentially needs new ingredients that have unique functionality that does, do not add a lot of cost. Um, and uh, the, the, the next one is appearance. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the color. I think that's been covered sort of, you know, it has to look good before it's getting cooked. In the raw state, it has to look good when it's cooked. It has to be realistic and all those kind of things. But it's more than that, that, that the, 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 the fibril structure, the text, the, the, the way the fiber are aligned and how it looks like, that has to look realistic too. If that looks funny, people will just, not, uh, that doesn't look like I want to eat this. Um, in a restaurant you, and so on, you can overcome this because you only get the cooked form. But if you also want to be you know, grilling it at home, those kind of things, the smell when you take it out of package, all of this has to has to be addressed. Otherwise, people will try it once and they say like, you know, I got it off my bucket list, but I'm, I'm going to go back to the real thing. Um, and then finally, cost. I mean, I think I brought cost up a couple of times, so that should not be a surprise right now. Um, it, it, the entire supply chain is entirely different. It is a much more complex uh, uh, supply chain, right? I mean, in, 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 the, in, the end of, in the end of the day, the current animal protein supply chain is quite optimized. I've been doing it for thousands and certainly in a more industrialized way for hundreds of years. And so this is all kind of new. There's lots of different ingredients. They come from a lot of different places. They all have to be trucked and shipped and so on. It's complex. It's not cheap. And it has to be, it has to be streamlined and it has to be scaled right. There's lots of uh, challenges uh, in front of us. Um, that need, that, those challenges need, uh, you need a lot of capital. That, uh, that capital um, has to, you know, cost of capital um, is, is, is quite high. The payback time has to, has to be reasonable for investors to really invest into this. Um, it, we, the, those are all challenges that you have to overcome. And, and I will bring that topic up again. We're not making iPhones here. We're making commodities. We're making burgers. We're making chicken wings. Those are fundamentally food commodities. So you, you, so if you, if you have a very complex, if you add a lot of complexity in terms of in terms of equipment and in, 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 in supply chain complexity, uh, the payback time will, will make it very difficult for investors to really go for it. Um, now let's switch gear and go from, from the plant-based side to the cultivated meat. Here, we're actually making bona fide meat. It's just not made in an animal, it's made in a bioreactor. That's really the biggest difference. And again, super simplified um, and, and oversimplified, uh, that's kind of the process chart, how this works. You, you, you basically do a biopsy and get some cells, um, muscle cells, you know, blood cells, uh, fat cells, and so on. Uh, you isolate that, you grow these cells with the right media. These cells have to be fed, they have to divide and grow and, and so on. And eventually you get some sort of dispersion of, of a sort of a, a meat cell this dispersion, if you want. And then you have to do some structuring to actually make it a, a, a meat product, right? And that's always, uh, that, that is actually always where a lot of the challenge will come in. Or you formulate into a hybrid, but then you're gonna have some of the problems we just uh, discussed around that. And then you have the, the downstream production distribution and all that kind of stuff. Again, that's identical. The meat industry has figured this out, uh, no problem there. Um, all right. Um, let me walk you just very briefly. So, a little bit, so where are some of the pain points here? This is much earlier. There's right now no real large scale plant on the planet. There have been some announcement, but there's there's no real large scale uh, plant. There's, there's uh, several companies, the leading companies have have put some 
some some uh, some pilot plants out there, but they're still sort of in the pharma type of scale. They're not food scale. So this this is this is very very early here in, in that respect, right? Um, the, the the big the, the big uh, challenges, and I think it was already highlighted in our chat, is cost. Uh, cost is in, enormous, and uh, uh, in order to get to just one percent of the today's animal production, you have to build um, uh, an enormous amount of bioreactors. Uh, that doesn't come without cost, and it doesn't come without energy and wastewater and all that kind of stuff. So cost is a big deal. It still needs um, the, the industry has done phenomenal progress. It's very impressive, but there's still a lot of fundamental technologies that have to be developed and, and, and further. Um, Manufacturing capabilities, I kind of highlighted this already. Again, this is where payback times for that in, for that investment really comes in very critical. This is going to be a, 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 a big deal, right? Um, and, and as we see, um, if any, any of you on the, on the phone have, have a capital project running right now, it's not fun right now. It's, you basically blow by 50% or more. So it's getting tougher by the minute. Um, and then there's uh, there's still con some concerns around consumer acceptance. Um, it, it 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 is it it is in in any it is, these are meat cells. Um, it is bona fide meat, but how do you how 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 does the consumer view that? Um, and I think that's maybe the a, a, a key message I want to leave everyone. The consumer ultimately dictates a lot of those things, and and uh, and if the consumer doesn't go along, you can't force people to do certain things. Um, you can entice them, but you can't really force them. And then, of course, regulatory side. Regulatory has made a lot of progress, really impressive. A lot of countries have actually instated to accelerate uh, their regulatory process for for this um, for, for for cultivated meat. In the U.S., we have seen uh, you know upside for one specific cell line has gotten the approval from the FDA. They're now waiting for USDA from the, from the uh, public announcements that I've seen, um, but it's it's moving in, in the right direction. In the last two minutes or so, let me just uh, highlight on the biggest cost drivers and, uh, and, and also the one that uh, the chemist in me gets excited about is, is the growth media. So how to feed the cells so the cells can do their thing and divide and grow. Um, and and it, in the end of the day, it has to have the same, macro, the same nutritional profile in there that we all eat by our cow or, uh, or chicken or anything. It has to have the 20 amino acids in there. It has to have the vitamins in there, sugars and, and growth factors and so on. So it's a cocktail of 70 plus ingredients that really um, have to be fed to those cells. Um, to, um, the amino acids are, are a huge cost driver. And, and what's interesting is that for, <laughs> ironically, for animal production, um, several, a few of those amino acids have been scaled to uh, become really cost-effective processes via fermentation, so you make you make the amino acids via 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 very efficient uh, um, um, fermentation process. But the bulk of the amino acids that's not true, and those processes have to be developed because each amino acid needs its own distinct chemical pathway to get there. So that's that's an enormous amount of um, you know scaling that's in front of us, and actually in, in invention and in innovation both. Um, and so that's that's going to be exciting. Um, so I, I just uh, caught, uh, uh, you know covered some of those uh, those things already. Um, maybe one more to, one more talk about the the, the capital side of things, right? Um, that, that's where the, the, you know you're running these processes. How you scale? You cannot go from an incubated or an inoculated cell directly to the full scale. You have to actually. The cell has to go through a, a series of scale-up steps, um, and you have to run uh, processes that have been. The pharma industry knows how to run those processes in a sterile environment today, but they only have to run it at a few thousand liters. Here, you, when, when you scale this, a factor of two orders of magnitudes, that becomes a whole different problem. So, uh, lots of challenges uh, in, in front of us. Um, but also very exciting. And uh, Nikki and Carlos, that's kind of what I had for the day. So just wanted to get sort of a little bit of a sense of the, the technology challenges and opportunities behind us. Uh, a lot of work in front of us, but uh, very exciting. I can tell you that much, never boring. Thanks so much, Florian. So you generated a lot of, there are a lot of questions from the audience. One quick clarifying question. Can you explain what disconnected value chain means? Well, 
in 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 a, in a way is that um, that you you basically uh, yeah you have the different ingredient suppliers and you have the different uh, if you take a formulation you have it, it, the value chain today is you have a meat processing plant and there's a farmer and that brings an animal and it's like it's a it's a it's a, it's a transaction of one thing to the other and the feed is a really it's a very simple kind of things to the farmer so it's a it's a pretty simple here you have 28 ingredients and so. Now you have all this there, all scale different. So it's it's a, it's a really kind of a, a tricky. And if you scale twenty six of them, but not the other two, you're still gonna. I mean, the the, the bottleneck is it's like your chain link, right? That was the weakest right. link is ultimately what's what. The, so now comes my biggest challenge: uh, stop sharing. I think I made it happen. All right. Yeah. So thanks so much. So to clarify, Dr. Schadenmann is Car Cargill's Chief Technology Officer and Vice President for Innovation and Research and Development. And he also leads the Strategic Growth Business Accelerator, which is designed to accelerate and scale cross Cargill innovation and science driven strategic growth businesses. And they're currently focused on alternative protein and human health technologies, as you heard from his talk today. Um, before he was at Cargill, um, since November 2018, he spent eight years at the Dow Chemical Company, so he also has a rich background in traditional chemistry, and his most recent role was Vice President for Performance Materials and Coatings R&D, so this is quite a switch from coatings R&D to food. Um, and he's also held leadership roles at Sulfa Company Incorporated and GE Biosilicones. Um, so with that, I think we have a quick poll question for everyone. And before Carlos will introduce um, Dr. Professor Wu. And this is for all of you. Do you think alternative meat, for example, lab-grown culture meat, plant-based meat is safe to consume? As participants fill that out, Carlos, would you like to go ahead and start introducing Dr. Wu? Indeed, thank you. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce our last speaker of this uh, webinar, uh, so Felicia Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu is actually the John, the John and A. Hanna Distinguished Professor of Food Safety, Toxicology and Risk uh, Assessment at Michigan State University and is president-elect of the Society for Risk Analysis. Uh, she works at the nexus of agriculture, food and nutrition, and public health to improve global human health outcomes. Uh, currently, she leads and co-leads nine extramural grants and one World Health Organization contract, wow, uh, with topics ranging from assessing the impact of climate change on aflatoxin risk in corn, improving resilience of food systems against shocks, reducing presence of mycotoxins, heavy metals, and pathogens in food crops, and assessing effects of uh, daily consumption of aflatoxin M1 on Ethiopian children's health. Uh, she's also an expert advisor to the joint FAO and WHO expert committee on food additives, and is an elected fellow of, for the Society of uh, Risk Analysis. Uh, she was appointed by Michigan governor to become a Commissioner of Agriculture and Rural Development for the state of Michigan. She earned uh, her PhD in Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. So maybe I saw you because I, I, I did my postdoctoral work in Carnegie Mellon. Maybe I saw you, maybe it's glad to see you again, probably. Uh, and uh, so she has an AB and SM in Applied Mathematics and Medical Sciences at Harvard University. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wood. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, for that introduction. I'm actually here at my 25th college uh, reunion right now, so it's nice to have the chance to take this break and to talk with you all. So it was very interesting to hear what my colleagues have had to say about climate change and about cellular agriculture and lab-based meat, as well as plant-based meat. Now I'll be talking about some of the food safety benefits and risks, which you all had the chance to vote about recently with future agricultural and food production technologies. So although this is a chemical sciences round table, and I was specifically asked to talk about chemicals and toxins in food, of course, when we're talking about these new agricultural and food production methods, we also need to 
very carefully consider the risks and the benefits with respect to the presence of microbial pathogens in our current food supply. So I'll be covering a little bit of both of these, but with more of a focus on chemicals. And I'll be sharing the current global picture with, with regards to food safety and foodborne disease from the global perspective, including a recent World Health Organization report on the global burden of foodborne disease, as well as a perspective from the US with some case studies specifically in foodborne chemicals of aflatoxin and touching on climate change, as Nick had done previously, as well as heavy metals in our food supply. Then we'll be looking at some of the benefits as far as the new technologies, such as meat substitutes, lab-based meat, indoor agriculture, and various biotechnologies, the food safety benefits that they could bring on board, as well as some remaining food safety risks that we really need to consider. So first, what do we think about when we think about food contaminants? You probably all have a picture in your mind of what you might be concerned about that might be in your food every time you sit down to eat a meal, whether it's at home, you're preparing it at home from various packaged foods or um, just raw ingredients, or whether you go out to a restaurant. Here are some of the common ones that are of concern from a public health standpoint. These include pesticide residues, and pesticides include insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, um, also rodenticides. Mycotoxins and phycotoxins, these are toxins that are produced by fungi and algae that end up in our food supply, in food crops, in seafood, et cetera. Heavy metals that might show up in our produce and in our cereal grains, including arsenic, cadmium, and lead. PFAS, the perf um, perfluorinated alkyl substances, and other emerging chemicals of concern that might, for example, be in our food packaging or might be introduced through irrigation water. And then as well, some food additives such as colors, flavorings, non-nutritive sweeteners, preservatives, et cetera. Those are concerns on the chemical side. And then from the perspective of microbial pathogens, we need to be concerned about viruses such as norovirus and hepatitis A virus. You hear about these quite frequently in the news. Bacteria, including some of your favorites that you might have heard about, Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, Listeria, and many others, and protozoan parasites such as Tania solium in um, insufficiently cooked pork, Toxoplasma, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, etc. Now, I had the um, privilege to participate in the first uh, World Health Organization foodborne disease burden epidemiology reference group. We had published a report in 2015 and had been working for the decade before that on trying to understand the burden of human disease that's caused by food contaminants. The way that we measured disease burden is not just in terms of, for example, people encountered this in their food, they got very sick and then they died, but also a measure of disability. How much did they suffer? How many days or how many years, depending whether it's on uh, acute gastroenteritis or even cancer caused by particular food contaminants? What is the burden of disease associated with multiple different contaminants? And we published this paper in um, 2015, and you can see just looking on the bottom um, the, the bottom axis, what some of the large range of some of the different types of chemicals, protozoan parasites, bacteria, and viruses that we assessed. And the largest offender, so to speak, in terms of the burden of disease in terms of years of life lost and years lived with disability was non-typhoidal Salmonella enterica. Second was Salmonella typhi. You can see aflatoxin on there, cassava cyanide, dioxins, et cetera. Now, to go into a little bit more detail of some of the basic results, and by the way, WHO is um, doing a second iteration of this report, um, and, and I'll be working with them on this as well. Um, in our first report, what we had found, and now it's quite likely that these may be underestimates, is that every year all around the world, one in 10 people fall ill from foodborne disease. There are roughly 33 million disability adjusted life years, or that is healthy years of life lost because people got sick, even if it did not necessarily lead to death. And there is about 420,000 deaths per year, roughly, sadly, about a third of which are in children under the age of five, and largely these children are dying from diarrheal disease from dehydration. 
Now, a similar study was conducted in the United States. This was published, you know, the, um, an effort led by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, published in 2011, that showed that here in the United States, on average, about 48 million people suffer food poisoning events every year. So that's over 10% um, of the US population. 128,000 are hospitalized as a result of food poisoning and about 3,000 every year die. Now, Nick had been talking earlier about some of the um, risks associated with climate change. And one of the largest ones is that climate change may in fact exacerbate food safety risks. Now I'll give you a brief case study of aflatoxin in US corn, which is an interesting one because it crosses to both the microbes and the chemicals, namely aflatoxin is a mycotoxin or a toxin that's produced by a particular group of fungi that do colonize our food crops. And so climate absolutely has an impact. So aflatoxin is produced primarily by the fungi Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus parasiticus, primarily in the crops of corn, peanuts, tree nuts such as almonds, pistachios, hazelnuts, walnuts, um, macadamia nuts, etc., and a variety of different spices. Now, these particular fungi that produce aflatoxin are warm weather fungi. Many microbes tend to thrive in warm environments. So up until now, aflatoxin has primarily been a problem in food uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, South, Southeast, and East Asia, Central America, and here in the United States, is aflatoxin has perennially been a problem in corn and peanuts that are grown in the Southern states from Texas, say, ranging to like the Carolinas and down to Florida. Now, aflatoxin was actually the chemical that was found to have the greatest human burden of disease by the World Health Organization. In fact, Aflatoxin has been known for over 60 years to cause liver cancer. There are well over 100,000 cases of liver cancer caused by aflatoxin per year around the world. And in particular, if your liver is already compromised, for example, if you're chronically infected with hepatitis B or hepatitis C, and you consume enough aflatoxin in your diet through corn, various nuts, such that it becomes detectable in your blood, then your lifetime risk of developing liver cancer is 60 times higher than if your liver is otherwise healthy, it's not infected with one of the hepatitis viruses, and if you consume lower levels of aflatoxin in your diet. It causes a number of other harmful health effects, including acute aflatoxicosis or liver failure at very high doses. Aflatoxin has been implicated in child stunting as well as immune system dysfunction. Now, here in the United States, fortunately, we don't have to worry too much about these health effects from the peanut butter and the corn chips and the packaged almonds that we eat, for example. Here the, in the U.S., the aflatoxin losses are primarily economic and primarily to corn growers in the U.S., now, we'd done a study in 2016 that was looking at three consecutive years of the aflatoxin-related economic damage to corn growers in the United States. Now, what's of interest in this particular table is that 2011 and 2013 were fairly, quote unquote, standard years as far as climate, particularly in the Midwest, where a lot of the corn in the field corn in the U.S. is grown. 2011 and 2013 didn't stand out as being particularly hot or particularly dry. 2012, as some of you who live in the Midwest may remember, was an unusually hot, had unusually hot and dry summers. And what happened was that Aspergillus flavus, which is normally confined to the U.S. South, then spread northward to the Corn Belt. And that meant that there was over a billion dollars worth of economic loss to corn growers that year because aflatoxin in the United States is regulated at the level of action levels by our U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And many, many corn growers had um, aflatoxin levels that exceeded the US FDA action levels, including in the Midwest, where usually there isn't the, uh, an aflatoxin problem at all. So you can see how climate change begins to become some of a concern. So I'll try to skip over this part fairly quickly, but we had done a, a modeling study of where aflatoxin was likely to spread in the United States in the next decade, from 2031 to 2040, as a result of projected climate patterns maximum and minimum daily temperature and precipitation across multiple different US counties all over all over the United States. And we did this using some um, various different climate projection models that were available on the NASA website. And our 
um, basically what we did was to create a model from past data looking at aflatoxin-related insurance claims collected on the USDA Risk Management Agency, and then we projected into the future based on ma maximum and minimum daily temperatures and precipitation, where is aflatoxin likely to be a problem in the future? Um, I'm going to skip over some of these. We had to account for different corn planting dates, as well as particular stages in which the fungus actually infects the corn after silking and after dent and how that changes. The main figure I wanted to share with you is this one. What we found was we looked at where aflatoxin insurance claims were made in the years 2011 to 2020. This means that the aflatoxin levels were so high that a corn grower had to file an insurance claim. And then using that data, we said, well, who's going to be filing these aflatoxin related insurance claims in the very near future? I mean, even just, even just eight years from now. It turns out that aflatoxin risk is going to be spreading northward. The, the particular states that are going to be the most hard hit in terms of economic damage are Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois, which on a regular basis right now don't usually have aflatoxin problems. And you can see that the problem will even be increasing in major corn producing states such as Iowa, and also, of course, Illinois and Nebraska. Now, this has really important implications because, first of all, this is occurring so near in the future from projections of climate, temperature, and precipitation. We see that aflatoxin problems are going to be spreading to the Corn Belt area where we're producing much of the corn that not only sources the United States, but the entire world, because we're by far the largest exporter around the world. We can see that there are some global food safety and security issues because we just don't want aflatoxin in our food. We know it causes liver damage and livestock and poultry health could likewise be compromised. This is one particular risk. Another one that has recently emerged from the chemicals and toxins side in the United States has to do with heavy metals. And this was really highlighted in a congressional report published two years ago, in which there was a survey done but pulling infant food off of grocery shelves and finding unusually high levels of arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. And so then this was also a great source of concern. How did these heavy metals end up in this infant food? What are the health effects and what can we do? And this congressional report recommended, among other things, the mandatory testing, labeling, and importantly, that the Food and Drug Administration should set action levels for these heavy metals in our food supply. So FDA has promptly, um, pro promptly set about with their closer to zero action plan that is uh, evaluating the science in terms of the dose response assessment, exposure assessment, how much of these heavy metals is actually in our food supply, and thereby what are reasonable actions to take, including the setting of action levels. What this means, of course, as with the case of aflatoxin, is that farmers need to be thinking a few steps down the line, thinking, well, if these action levels are going to be in place, that means that we need to start thinking about what kinds of mediation strategies and what kinds of economic losses or gains might be incurred in the future from the control of heavy metals in food. And here are some of the different types of strategies that can help to reduce heavy metals in the food supply. But then we need to be concerned about, well, these, these could be costly to, to farmers. And are there any sort of win-win strategies in terms of improving production while reducing the risk of these heavy metals in food? So these, these are some of the common concerns. But now to turn to the general topic of these future agriculture and food, food production technologies that have been mentioned over the last hour, these have some potential to improve food safety. And I want to share with you some of these ideas. That if we are producing you know, plant-based meat or cellular meat, there will be less environmental pathogen exposure because the, the lab-based meat and meat alternatives can bypass some of the production risks that we currently incur from infected livestock and poultry, including on the surfaces, for example, why we are concerned now about not cooking our hamburgers sufficiently because it, the, the surface may have been contaminated with salmonella, with E. coli, et cetera, and then it gets ground into the rest of the burger. That's not something we typically need to be thinking about with lab-based meat and meat alternatives. There are secondary benefits as well from crop production because there's less risk of pathogen and heavy metal exposure from nearby animal operations, from the shedding of um, 
various pathogens in animal feces, for example, or that it could be dust borne and then land in nearby crop fields, and also the risk of contaminated water being used for irrigation. In addition, there could be less environmental chemical exposure, um, fewer pesticide residues, for example, if we're uh, the uh, indoor agriculture is another hot burgeoning field in food production. And if it's a controlled environment that keeps out the pests, then you need fewer pesticide applications. Biotechnologies can help to resist these pests as well. If we can control the soil or the water, then there might be less crop uptake of PFAS and heavy metals and other chemicals. There would be fewer mycotoxins, including aflatoxin, because the fungi would not be in these indoor environments. And then there's also less vulnerability to climate change. There's also less animal antibiotic use in lab-based meat and meat alternatives. But there are still some remaining food safety risks. Food processing plants. These processing plants can harbor bacteria and other pathogens. In fact, it was from a food processing plant that there was a recent concern about Chronobacter in infant formula, for example. There's still the risk that you often hear about in the news of foods being recalled because of the presence of glass metal or wood shards and chips. Those are from food processing plants. We need to be very careful of the integrity of the ingredients used in meat substitutes and animal cells for lab-grown meat, that they're tested for the pr presence of pathogens, chemicals, and toxins. Um, when, my, when my colleague Florian was talking about the importance of lab-based meat textures, they're often based on scaffolds. Scaffolds can be made from fungi, um, and the uh, a particular combinations of fungi or other types of materials, if you have one type of scaffold that might make your meat resemble steak, another one like hamburger, we need to make sure that whatever materials we're using for scaffolds such as fungi are also free of toxins and other risky agents. Now food packaging may still contain PFAS and other chemicals, and these would end up in our food regardless of whether we uh, use traditional agriculture or new ag food production technologies. And really importantly, um, CDC just came out with a report very recently that showed that 40% of US food poisoning outbreaks with a known cause are linked to sick restaurant workers. And there isn't really anything we can do about that. The human behavior aspect is really important as well. So in summary, foodborne disease causes millions of illnesses annually, both in the United States and worldwide, so food safety is absolutely a risk, and climate change could be exacerbating these food safety risks. These new ag food production technologies we've talked about today could improve food safety in a variety of ways, but there are still some remaining food safety risks related to our processing plants, the safety of our ingredients, and most importantly, human behaviors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia, for a very, very nice presentation. Uh, I don't know you, Nick, but I think I actually have more questions um, and answers uh, to, to the, you know, and this is very, very interesting. I think it's a fascinating uh, set of topics. Agreed. And I think, uh, yeah, so that would be great. So I think we're ready to move to the questions and answers uh, uh, session. And uh, so we have collected some of the questions that have been sent to you uh, by the audience. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, before we do that, we're gonna have another poll uh, question here. Uh, processed food. How often do you incorporate processed foods into your lifestyle? Uh, it's a multiple choice and there is no wrong or right answer. So you don't get penalized for that, okay? So please go ahead and answer and uh, then we'll move on to the question and answers uh, session. I guess, uh, I guess uh, in the interest of time, we should probably move into that. And uh, Nikki, I know that you have other commitments. Uh, do you want to go ahead and go first? Yeah. Uh, we have the results. There you go. No. <laughs> right. All right. So there was a question addressed to you. And I think uh, so. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the question because I would like your answer, but I would actually like to hear from the, 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 the other, the, the rest of the panel. Uh, the question was, uh, do you believe we need to advance the research tools, methods, me data, mechanisms that will be needed to engineer consumer accepted taste and sensorial products? Or do you believe that the research tools exist? And that question was posed by Gerard Bailey. Yeah, and I can touch on this and uh, others definitely feel free to jump in. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the most up-to-date on the most advanced research tools. I was highly involved in the research early on in Impossible and in the last... Uh, 70 years, much more on the commercial side. 
but I know like we, we had to develop a ton of methodologies, a ton of tools internally. And so I'll use a couple of examples. You know, a lot of the research on, uh, we did was trying to understand what actually makes meat, fish, and dairy foods so good and so delicious and so craveable. And then, you know, we did a lot of that work with GCMSs, LCMSs, and all the tools and the software for it were for completely other uses. That's not the way the food industry really worked, looked at systems like this. And so we spent a ton of time developing the software and the analysis tools for trying to understand the data that we could get um, from the data that comes out of the mass specs to the data is like for like the GCMS that goes to your nose and trying to link it all together. And so um, I don't know if that's advanced. I would assume it's advanced some, but my guess is it's still not nearly where it needs to go. And then you get to like texture properties and sensory properties and things like this when consumers are eating and consuming the foods, which is very complex because everybody's palate and everyone's like preferences are different. And so we definitely did research trying to find ways to make that really scalable and fast moving and stuff like that. And it's tough. It's so hard to do it. And so there's so much opportunity in sens sensory science to make it a stronger science and tie that to the foods that, you know, people want and making foods that are way, way, way better than what we have today. So I would say there's certainly massive opportunities in that is my guess. Um, like I said, I'm not the most up to date the last five years, but uh, I, it's a very good question. I can I can chime in a little bit, and it's a very thoughtful question, and you know, great to hear from you, Gerard. Um, I, I would say that it's so uh, certainly on the uh, there's some breakthroughs needed on the on the cultivated side, right? I think uh, there's no doubt um, in, in getting that really into the right uh, you know cost effective state. Um, where I feel like uh, it, what's going to be super interesting to see over the next few years is. Uh, how ingredient informatics, um, and so you can screen a lot more, you can really understand um, the, the, the structure, you know, the structure property relationships of these complex formulation. Um, I always thought formulating in the chemical industry with very discrete polymers and that I have a very unique, a very, very regular sequence of monomers in the polymer is complicated. Here we have natural polymers and natural ingredients and, and how they interact, I think there will be and ultimately, that's going to be one of the prime cases for generative AI. And I think what we're going to see over the next five years will be uh, exciting and mildly frightening. But I think it'll be interesting how that's going to play and, 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 and how do you can predict some of those kind of interactions and how you, how you ultimately correlate, let's say, a, a structure with a mouthfeel. I think there's a lot of work to be done still. And I think that when, when that hits the uh, full tilt, I think that that could be exciting. Just a couple of perspectives. No idea if it's going to happen exactly that way. So Florian, you bring up um, the, the, the risks. Uh, we hadn't even thought, I mean, Felicia gave a fantastic summary uh, yeah. of the risks from the pathogen standpoint, but you're also, you're, you, it sounds like you're alluding to other risks that we should think about in thinking about these kinds of foods. Yeah, and uh, I'm, uh, I was more concerned about like how do you how do you get to overcome some of those challenges better? But but now generative AI it, it can can bring all kinds of risks because maybe you're going to come with a solution that a machine developed that is based on some proprietary information from somebody else, uh, and you know uh, I you know it, it 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 can get very interesting very quickly over the next few years, and I think it's just at at the pace of how this. How is this this is developing is is, is really interesting, uh, but the other thing that is um, um, I think the processing techniques. There, it, so so processing and advances in processing is where I feel like a lot of the unlock comes. Processing is not always the most sexy part. I'm a chemist and I have to say that. Um, however. When you think about how to make this all work economically, how do you get the payback times, the, the cost of capital to a level that you can build all these new supply chains, right? I mean, there's a lot of installed capital in the world right now that does exactly what we do today. And so how do you move that? Um, processing will do everything in it. And, and uh, all, the, all the glory goes to new protein forms and new functionalities and new, uh, and new formulations and so on but finding mild natural processing ways that get you in a very effective way is where a lot of the future will sit. Now, we have seen some, some, some hydrochloride technologies and some interesting processing technologies that might get us there, um, but it's early stage. So um, Felicia, could you follow up on that do, in terms of, cause you were talking about that the 
even though these sort of lab grown meats will solve some of the food safety issues that we've have currently, but they bring up a new set of issues, including in processing. So do, we, do you want to elaborate that, on that, especially after what Florian just said? Definitely the processing is going to, it, um, it could potentially introduce a number of risks because microbial pathogens, some chemicals could be present in the processing plants for these different types of the, the cellular meats, the plant-based meats. And so we need to make sure that the, the conditions are always sanitary, that they're being inspected, et cetera. And I, um, that's, that's on the processing side. There's also issues related to, as I mentioned, the scaffolding, the various different types of chemicals, or you know, e even if they are from, from a natural source, that and we need to check the safety of those as well. The, sca the you know, the fungal scaffolds that are used in some of these cellular-based meats, et cetera. Um, I noticed that one person had raised the question in the QA of well, how can we deal with this problem of sick restaurant workers that are making people sick? I mean, regardless of how, we, whether we're making plant-based meat or cellular meat. And I think that that's a great question. And yes, absolutely. If we can have paid sick leave, better policies for restaurant workers in the U.S., I think that that would absolutely be a way that then they would not feel that there was any sort of economic loss if they could not or that they had to come into work even if they were sick and then potentially get many many more people sick i think that 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 is a really important uh, point and it's a different policy realm from what we're talking about but i think it's absolutely important to consider part of culture so another issue related to to safety is actually food authenticity right especially you know the concerns with the lab grown meat you know people the bad actors can actually get access to this technology and trying to actually fake some of these, these foods with low quality, uh, possibly hurting people, and also the industry. So can any one of you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts about that and how do you think this can actually be averted or ameliorated? What's the question for? Well, anyway. the question is for any of you. Yes. Let's start with you, Florian. What do you think? About uh, traceability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. V very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we, we try to keep that uh, in mind here. It's, it's, and it's not just uh, the traceability within, it is also food security across, right? Is, is, are you gonna be exposed to a specific ingredient that sits in a different country? And all of a sudden, I mean, we saw that with uh, sunflower oil, right? Uh, 70 some percent of sunflower oil come from Ukraine and Russia. We all know what happened here. All of a sudden we were reformulating like crazy everywhere around the world for baby food. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a connected world that is becoming a little less connected uh, uh, politically. And so there's those kind of things, and I think um, you know traceability is another good point. Yeah, we we, we can we can um, that's a challenge to some degree today, right? I mean, when you in 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 our food system, and and um, the more complex you make it, uh, the the harder that gets. But I think that the foods the food security um, and cross border aspect is actually what's at least for us uh, as a very globally connected company in cargo is the most scary part of that. And the more the more ingredient flows, and the more you, the, the 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 more challenging that gets. To, to Flor uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Felicia. To add to Florian's points with regard to Carlos's question about um, traceability, FDA has recently made many strides with regard to traceability policies and understanding what the benefits of those are from a food safety standpoint. Namely, if you have traceability um, technologies in place, then you can very quickly isolate, you know, when, when there is any sort of risk, food safety risk, and then trace it back to, you know, maybe it would be an individual farm, maybe it would be an individual processing plant, but the more quickly you can isolate where the problem is occurring, the more quickly you can deal with it. And then there isn't um, this economic loss to say everybody who might be producing romaine lettuce, for example, and there isn't this constant consumer fear as well that just stretches out and out because um, an outbreak is continuing and we don't really know the source. Traceability is all about you know getting to the source, isolating it, dealing with it, and it's it's really really important from a food safety standpoint. It, it is more. 
Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Florian. It is more important. It is more complex in our industry, right? Because it's a much more technical industry. But we can learn more from industries that have, like automotive and, and aerospace, that have done uh, or were forced to do this, right? That's much more controlled, and it's it's and it's much, it's less complex. But I think a lot of work has to be done. Sorry, I wanted to. Yeah. So, do you see any new technologies or um, new chemistries that need, or chemical engineering techniques that need to be developed in this space in the um, authenticity, new sensors, new um, new assays? Yeah. Um, I it's it's um it's maybe a matter of priority right now. I I feel like in order to get uh, to the level, there's so many technical challenges. I just took a very few and give you a, like a, maybe a flavor of what's in, ahead of us. But I think it's 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 maybe a good thought to, um, I don't necessarily have to answer Nikki, um, but I, I feel like it could be some chemical handles that can be built in or so, um, but um, but maybe it's a good way to, so as we solve challenges in this industry to to build that in, right? And I think that's, uh, that's certainly, uh, um, I mean, in terms of, in terms of a, a smart manufacturing and digitized supply chain would help a lot. If you know this solve comes from this and it goes and it comes from that plant and it goes into this growth media and then and, and it and it and it, and it, and it uh, you know those kind of things are relatively uh, relatively easy. It gets a little harder. I, I think I think I, I think it I think it's actually doable um, if you if you really uh, digitize the supply chain. And that is very tricky, and it's and, and it's a low, it's a it's not a super high margin industry, and mm -hmm. smart manufacturing uh, and, and, and digitizing all those kind of things will take time and costs. So, so that's where where we're just in the middle of the transition. So you suggested something like a blockchain for 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 food. <laughs> Well, to some degree, we tried it. So maybe three years ago, we had a, you know, so you could really like you, if you buy a turkey um, for Thanksgiving and then you, you put the barcode in there and then you can see exactly where, uh, who, who, where, uh, where uh, custody was held along in, in the, and you could go all the way back to the, to the farm where it was raised and so on. Um, I don't consumers care all that much, but I think it's, I think it's more to Felicia's point. I think it's going to be important for, nailing down if there's a safety issue somewhere quickly right and so on so oh here was a problem that's kind of what happened in industries like automotive or so we're like or or so we're like hey this valve made in wisconsin at that time led to something in a different you know to the to a failure of an engine later on or something i'm making this up right now don't don't blame anybody in Wisconsin, but um, but the idea is along those ways, right? That you can get to the source of the problem quickly. I think that's was a really thoughtful comment from Felicia to, to get to that point. So, from a greenhouse gas point of view, Rich Helling was asking, "What's the difference between plant-based and cultured meats?" That's a really interesting question, and I I saw that and was trying to think about how to formulate an answer to it. I think that there's an answer for now and that there may be an answer in the future. <laughs> and just based on the costs of producing, say, one patty, my guess would be that the greenhouse gases are quite a bit, um, you know, there's there's probably a lot more greenhouse gas emissions from producing the cell-based um, meat rather than the plant-based meat right now, just because of the difference in costs. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to do what, um, there's a particular type of process called a life cycle impact assessment, where you're looking at, you know, from, from the moment that you source the ingredients to make your food all the way through the production process. I mean, everything in the laboratory, you know, you know, in, in the making the scaffolding, the texture, you know, formulating it according to taste. If you look to see how much energy, how much water, et cetera, was used in this entire process, then you get a sense of what the, you know, among other things, what the greenhouse gas emissions would be. Looking at costs right now, I would say probably it is um, the greenhouse gas emissions are higher for for animal based uh, for for lab uh, for for cellular meat. But that may that may change in the future with new technologies. This is a a, a great question, and and we have thought a lot about this in you know doing LCA life cycle analyses across all these value chains. This is something we're really uh, really concerned about and. And, uh, and and actually they're they're very very different than the animal side, right? You have beef versus pork versus 
chicken. Chicken is actually quite, uh, it has a, a quite uh, low sustainability footprint. Uh, and, and so when you compare that, um, I, 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 so the, the best case, and you have to make assumptions to Felicia's point, current, no chance they're they're not efficient enough. But if you if you assume a bunch of efficiencies, you know um, you know these uh, uh, plant based and, and, and as well as cultivated can maybe match chicken. But chicken is quite good. It's uh, you you have, you have you you also have quite some drivers of greenhouse gases in 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 these uh, in these alternative proteins. So uh, this jury is still out, and it requires a bunch of process improvements and efficiency gains. And if you Go to a very small green um, uh, ingredient deck, and you can mildly process it. That will help you a lot. We're not there yet, so the best ones are are not even uh, you know are not even close to uh, to to chicken yet. So anyway, just as a couple of high level thoughts. Well, that is a great way to end this. There's still a lot of science that we need to do as well as well as social sciences. It sounds like. Um, thank you so much, Carlos. This was a great, <laughs> great yeah, webinar. This was, uh, was uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still hungry, but uh, this is very good. It was very good. Very nice. And unfortunately, we didn't get to all the questions. There's so, this is going to raise so many interesting uh, questions. Um, I really want to thank everyone for tuning in and the three speakers, Mr. Hala, Dr. Schattenmann, and Dr. Wu. Thank you so much for your time. The three presentations and the recording of the webinar will be posted to the Chemical Sciences Roundtable website next week. If anyone has additional questions, comments, or concerns, please email csr at nas.edu. And once the webinar closes, attendees will be automatically directed to a survey to provide feedback on the webinar. We Please do fill this out. We would love to get your feedback from this. Um, and we also have the upcoming events on open access webinar and workshop series and talking about open access publishing and where the scientific publishing endeavor is going. So we would love to hear your comments, feedback, and your participation in those. Um, for information about upcoming CSR events and more, they, you can subscribe to updates, which can be done on the Chemical Sciences Roundtable website. Thank you again and have a great day.